Solving the Measurement Problem, a presentation by Massimiliano Sassoli de Bianchi and Luca Sassoli de Bianchi. In quantum mechanics, the state of a physical entity can evolve either deterministically, when it does not interact with its environment, or non-deterministically, when subjected to a measurement process. In the latter case, the initial state of the entity, let us call it Psi0, can collapse into different possible states, Psi1, Psi2, Psi3, and so on. But the experimenter cannot predict in advance, not even in principle, which of them will be the final outcome. However, a powerful rule exists in quantum mechanics, called the Born Rule providing the probabilities for the different outcomes, linking in this way the theory with the experiments. The measurement problem, in a nutshell, is about finding the missing description of what goes on behind the scenes during a measurement process, thus explaining the origin and values of the quantum probabilities. But for this, we have to take quantum theory very seriously. And this means that the state Psi of a physical entity describes its actual condition and not just our knowledge of it. A quantum measurement is an objective physical process of the change of state and not a subjective process of the acquisition of knowledge on the part of the experimenter. The experimenter's consciousness does not play any causal role in a quantum measurement, no psychophysical effects. A measurement can only produce a single outcome at a time, and not all the outcomes at the same time, each in a different parallel world. In other terms, we have to make the cognitive effort of identifying a physical mechanism able to explain how the quantum probabilities can result from the interaction between the measuring apparatus and the measured entity. For this, we need to come back to the absolute principle of the experimental method. It was announced by Claude Bernard, the father of scientific physiology, in 1949, and it affirms that if an experiment, when repeated many times, gives different results, then the associated experimental conditions must have been different each time. Because of very classical training, physicists were initially brought to assume that what could fluctuate in an experiment was the state of a physical entity, and that by taking these fluctuations into account, the quantum probabilities could be explained. This, however, didn't work as expected because of the so-called no-go theorems, an example of which are the famous Bell's inequality. Another possibility, proposed by the Belgian physicist Diederik Ertz in the 80s of the last century, is to attribute the fluctuations not to the state of the entity, but to its interaction with the measuring apparatus then the no-go theorems no longer apply, and it becomes possible not only to conceptually explain the nature of a quantum measurement, but also to derive in a non-circular way the Born rule. Erd's proposal is today known as the hidden measurement interpretation of quantum mechanics. In recent times, it received a very complete modelization in what has been called the extended block representation of quantum mechanics. The purpose of this video is to show how this representation works and can be used not only to solve the measurement problem, but also to visualize a quantum measurement in a very clear and precise way. Regarding the problem of visualizing a quantum process, the American physicist Jeremy Bernstein wrote, Once he had his matrix mechanics, Heisenberg was able to reproduce all the results of the old quantum theory and more. It was the first example of a kind of Faustian bargain quantum theorists were to make 
with the spirit of visualization. Namely, one will be allowed to predict experimental results with very high accuracy, provided that one did not ask for a visualization of the phenomena, but went beyond the rules themselves. Similarly, the German physicist Max Born, the discoverer of the statistical rule that bears his name, wrote, No language which lends itself to visualizability can describe quantum jumps. And the English physicist Paul Dirac also wrote, In the case of atomic phenomena, no picture can be expected to exist in the usual sense of the word picture. This idea that quantum processes are beyond the reach of any explicit representation is supported today by the majority of physicists. However, as we are now going to show, it is the result of a misconception. Indeed, quantum measurement can be easily visualized and explained using the extended block representation of quantum mechanics. For simplicity, we start by describing the simplest possible situation, that of a quantum measurement that can only produce two different outcomes. This is the case, for instance, when we measure the spin of an electron, which can only be found to be either up or down with respect to a given direction. Now, in 1946, the Swiss physicist Felix Bloch has shown that it is possible to represent the states of a two-level system as simple points at the surface of a three-dimensional sphere of unit radius, today called the Bloch sphere. So we can represent the initial state psi zero of the system prior to the measurement as a point particle at the surface of the block sphere. Clearly, also the two possible outcome states of the measurement, let us call them Psi1 and Psi2, can be represented as points on the sphere and it can be shown that they have to be antipodal points. Describing and explaining the measurement process is about finding a mechanism that can explain how the point particle, representative of the initial state psi zero, can non-deterministically move either to the final state psi one or to the final state psi two in accordance with the Born rule. This means that if we repeat many times the process, the probabilities P1 and P2 for the two possible transitions have to correspond exactly to those predicted by the Born rule. To do so, we need to extend the block sphere in order to use it not only to represent the states, but also the measurements. For this, we observe that, by definition, two antipodal points are so situated that a line drawn from one point to the other will pass through the center of the sphere and form a true diameter. This diameter is precisely the region of potentiality characterizing the quantum observable, which has the two states Psi1 and Psi2 as its possible outcomes, called eigenstates in the quantum jargon. A simple way to describe this potentiality region is as a uniform and sticky elastic band stretched between the two points Psi1 and Psi2. But it is now time to see how a quantum measurement unfolds within the block sphere. So, we have a block spheres of states, the point particle representative of the initial state in which the quantum entity is prepared before the measurement, and finally the one-dimensional elastic structure representative of the observable that we want to measure, which for instance could be a spin observable, with its two endpoints corresponding to the two possible outcomes of the measurement. Then the measurement corresponds to the following two-stage process. During the first stage, 
which is purely deterministic, the point particle plunges into the sphere along a path which is orthogonal to the elastic band and firmly attaches to it. The second stage of the measurement is purely non-deterministic and it corresponds to the breaking of the elastic band at some unpredictable point. When this happens, the point particle, which is attached to one of the two broken fragments, will be pulled toward one of the two endpoints, producing in this way the final outcome of the measurement. Let us observe the entire process another time. As we can see, depending on where the elastic breaks, we will obtain one rather than the other outcome. More precisely, each breakable point of the elastic corresponds to a different measurement interaction between the elastic and the point particle that is attached to it. In other terms, the uniformly breakable elastic is representative of the collection of all the potential measurement interactions which are available to be actualized. It is worth observing that before deterministically falling onto the elastic, the point particle is in a superposition state with respect to the two outcomes of the measurement. When it falls onto the elastic, it experiences the equivalent of a decoherence process, but when it sticks onto the elastics, and as long as the elastic remains unbroken, its state is still the expression of a superposition of possibilities. Finally, when the elastic breaks, only one among the infinity of potential measurement interaction is actualized, and the point particle is drawn accordingly to one of the two possible end states. But let us now show that the process we have just described within the extended block spheres allows us to obtain the exact quantum probabilities, that is, to derive the Born rule. For this, we observe that the point particle representative of the initial state Psi0 makes a certain angle with respect to the elastic band. Let us call this angle theta. We also observe that when the particle falls onto the elastics, it defines two line segments, L1 and L2. It is then clear that if the elastic breaks in L1, the final outcome will be Psi1, and if it breaks in L2, the final outcome will be Psi2. Then, being the elastic, by hypothesis, uniform and of total length 2, twice the unit radius, it is clear that the probability P1 for the transition to Psi1 will be given by the length of the segment L1 divided by 2. And considering that the length of L1 is 1 plus cosine of theta, we obtain for the probability P1 the following formula. A similar reasoning gives for the probability P2 the following formula. And these two formulae are the well-known expressions predicted by the Born rule. At this point, one may object that if we have been able to derive the Born rule, it is just because we have limited our discussion to two-dimensional, two-outcome quantum systems. Indeed, the celebrated Gleason's theorem, which was instrumental in ruling out the existence of the hidden variable explanation of quantum theory, is valid only for situation of more than two outcomes. In addition to that, the American mathematician Simon Cochen and the Swiss mathematician Ernst Specher, back in the 60s, were able to construct an explicit realization for the measurement of a two-dimensional entity, but they pointed out on many occasions that their model could not work for higher dimensional situations. Therefore, one may rightly suspect 
the hidden measurement explanation that we have presented to be just a two-dimensional anomaly, impossible to generalize to a situation of more than two outcomes. This objection, however, is unfounded for at least two reasons. The first one, as we mentioned already, is that in the extended block representation, the hidden variables are not associated with the state of the entity, but with the measurement interactions. This is why the introduction does not restore determinism, which is what physicists have historically tried to obtain when exploring hidden variable models. In other words, the no-go theorems only forbid the replacement of quantum mechanics by a more fundamental, fully deterministic theory, in which the probabilities of having or not having a certain property can only take the values 0 or 1. The second reason is that the Bloch model can be easily generalized to more general experimental situations. So our next step is to describe the situation of a quantum measurement that can produce three different outcomes. The initial state Psi0 of the system prior to the measurement is now a point particle at the surface of a generalized Bloch sphere which it can be shown to be eight-dimensional, and which of course we can no longer explicitly draw. Also, different from the two-outcome case, only a small convex portion of the block sphere will be filled with states, but this is a technical detail we don't have to worry about in the following of our description. The three possible outcome states of the measurement, let us call them Psi1, Psi2 and Psi3, can be represented as points located somewhere on the surface of this eight-dimensional hyperspheres. However, it is possible to demonstrate that they necessarily lay on a same two-dimensional plane defining the vertices of an equilateral triangle inscribed in the sphere. Describing and explaining the measurement process is about finding a mechanism that can explain how the point particle, representative of the initial state Psi0, can non-deterministically move to one of the three final states in accordance with the Born rule. This means that if we repeat many times the process, the probabilities P1, P2, and P3 for the three possible transitions have to correspond exactly to those predicted by the Born rule. For this, we can now describe the region of potentiality associated with a quantum observable having the free state Psi1, Psi2, and Psi3 as its outcomes as a uniform and breakable elastic membrane stretched between these three points representative of the outcomes in the generalized block sphere. But let us see how the quantum measurement unfolds in this case. So we have the two-dimensional elastic membrane representative of the observable that we want to measure with its three vertices corresponding to the three possible outcomes of the measurement and the point particle, representative of the initial state in which the quantum entity is prepared at the surface of the eight-dimensional block sphere of states. Then, the measurement corresponds to the following two-stage process. During the first, purely deterministic stage, the point particle plunges into the hypersphere along a path which is orthogonal to the membrane and firmly attaches to it. When this happens, it defines three different triangular subregions on the membrane, delineated by line segments connecting the particle's position with the three vertex points. We have to think of these line segments as tension lines, making the membrane less easy to break along them. The second stage of the measurement is purely non-deterministic. Once the particle is on the membrane, attached to it, 
the latter breaks at some unpredictable point, belonging to one of the three subregions. The T-ring then propagates inside that specific subregion as a sort of disintegrative process, but not in the other two subregions because of the presence of the tension lines. This will cause the two anchor points of the disintegrating subregion to also tear away, thus producing the detachment of a membrane, which, being elastic, will contract towards the only remaining anchor point, drawing to that position also the point particle attached to it, which then will reach its final state corresponding to the outcome of the measurement. Similarly to the two outcome situation, it is possible to show that the process we have just illustrated within the extended block sphere allows to obtain the exact quantum probabilities, that is, to derive the Born rule. As we already observed, the point particle, when attached to the membrane, it defined three distinct regions, subregions, A1, A2, and A3. It is then clear that if the elastic breaks in A1, the final outcome will be Psi1. If it breaks in A2, the final outcome will be Psi2. And if it breaks in A3, the final outcome will be Psi3. Therefore, being the member by hypothesis uniform, it is also clear that the probability P1 for the transition to Psi1 will be given by the area of the subregion A1 divided by the total area of the membrane, and similarly for the other two transitions. And if the calculation of these relative areas are done properly, one can show that they give exactly the probabilities predicted by the Born rule. We will not perform here this calculation as this would take us too far from the scope of this video and we simply refer the interested viewer to the references cited at the end of it. Let us now also consider the case of a four-outcome measurement. This is the last situation that can be partially visualized. In this case, the generalized Brock spheres is 15 dimensional. The potentiality region is a tetrahedron inscribed in the 15 dimensional block sphere filled with a uniform elastic and disintegrable substance with its four vertices associated with the four possible outcome states. The point particle, when it enters the potentiality region, it defines four different subregions. And the four transition probabilities are given by the relative volume of these subregions. But let us see how the quantum measurement unfolds in this case. We have a measurement tetrahedron, here represented as inscribed in a three-dimensional sphere, which is just a projection of the entire 15-dimensional block sphere. Obviously, we cannot visualize the first deterministic stage of the process during which the point particle plunges into the hypersphere along a path which is orthogonal to the three-dimensional subspace containing the tetrahedron and attaches to it in one of its interior points. Let us make, for a moment, the tetrahedron transparent, so that we can see where the point particle landed inside of it. As we can see, the particle defines four different disjoint subregions inside the tetrahedron, separated by tension lines and associated tension surfaces on which the membrane can less easily break and disintegrate. The second non-deterministic stage of the measurement starts when the substance filling the tetrahedron starts disintegrating at some unpredictable point belonging to one of the four subregions. The disintegrative process then propagates inside that specific subregion, but not in the other three subregions, because of the presence of a tension line and tension surfaces. This will cause the three anchor points of the disintegrating subregion to tear away, thus producing its detachment 
and being the substance elastic, it will collapse towards the only remaining anchor point, drawing to that position also the point particle attached to it, which in this way will reach its final outcome state. Alright, we have now reached the end of this presentation, and we hope you have enjoyed it. What we have described for the two, three and four outcome measurements can be easily and naturally generalized to arbitrary n outcome measurements and even to so-called degenerate measurements. Of course, much more should be said about the extended block representation and its hidden measurement interpretation, which technically speaking is a completed version of quantum mechanics, in which also the so-called density operators the points inside the block sphere play a role as pure states of a quantum entity. But the discussion, as it is easy to understand, would become too technical, and this is not the scope of this video. If you are a professional physicist and would like to deepen your understanding of the solution that we have presented in this video, we recommend the reading of the following open source article by Diederik Erz and Massimiliano Sassoli de Bianchi, the extended block representation of quantum mechanics and the hidden measurement solution to the measurement problem, published in the Annals of Physics. If you have a good scientific background but would like to read a less technically involved text, we recommend the following article written as a dialogue, Many Measurement or Many Worlds? A Dialogue, published in the Foundation of Science. If you have no specific knowledge about physics and would like to read a more pedestrian text on the hidden measurement interpretation, we recommend the reading of the following booklet, a trailer of which can be viewed on YouTube. Observer Effect, The Quantum Mystery Demystified, published by Adea Edizioni. A final recommendation is the YouTube video entitled The Physics of Spaghetti, Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle and Quantum Non-Speciality non-locality. Thank you for watching this video. We hope to be back soon with a new presentation, maybe the next time we will explain what the entanglement paradox is and how it can be solved.